Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful academic program. So why should we be speaking on MRI safety today in this 20th MRI teaching course? So as you know, MRI is safe, but if it's something goes wrong, as is the adage says, it can go very wrong. As far as safety concerns, if MRI is concerned, you remember the famous um, and unfortunate case actually in few years back, three years back, when a man died in Mumbai's hospital. I was stuck to the MRI machine for four hours. Actually, was an attendee, attendant to a patient who was to undergo an MRI. And unfortunately, scum that once again highlighted this serious safety issues of MRI. It actually dates back to 2001, and nearly two decades have passed. You see that a six-year-old boy died of skull injury during MRI. And this is what actually prompted the American College of Radiology at that time to develop a blue ribbon panel of MRI experts, which included radiologists, physicians, PhDs, technologists, and representatives from corporate FTEs and the law profession. And they published the white paper on MR safety in 2002, actually, which was the first document. And this was subsequently revised in 2013 and forms the basis of the current recommendations, right? So coming to MR safety, actually there are a lot of issues which can occur as far as MR safety is concerned, which includes projectile injuries, which I just mentioned a while ago. This could also include issues with implant, quenching of MR, use of MR contrast, medical emergencies, heating, sedation, impact rates, and acoustic noise as well. So I'm going to take you through them one by one, okay? So let me introduce to the magnetic fields. You can have three different types of effects. One is because of a static magnetic field of the magnet. This is what gives rise to the devices, implants, and projectile kind of injuries. Second would be the effects because of the radio frequency pulses, and this leads to heating of tissues and thermal injuries. And then is the magnetic field gradient, which can cause nerve stimulation injuries or acoustic noise. Let's start with the effects of static magnetic field first. So as you know, as seen in this picture, there's a coil around the axis of the board, right? And the magnetic field inside the board is nearly 10,000 to 100,000 times the magnitude on the Earth's surface. So as you know, this is immersed in liquid helium. And once established, the main magnetic field remains on for several hundreds of years. There is a 5G line which as per the US FDA 2005 norms, which is usually marked inside the MR gantries in all the units, right? As you can see, this is a red line here at my own institute here. So this is the upper limit where the field strength is of no potential concern for the general public. The field really drops to 0 0.005 tons, but this does not safeguard against projectile incident. So this, is, this terminology you should be aware of, a 5G line. The effects of static magnetic field will be causing safety issues is because of the attraction of the ferromagnetic material towards the magnet. And this can cause projectile injuries or biological changes. So if the magnetic field strength is less, you are going to have no serious cardiovascular effects. There might mild increase in amplitude of T waves. But above 2 TT, above 2 Tesla of MRI magnet strength, there have been reports of fatigue, headaches, hypotension, irritability, and problems in imaging in sickle cell anemia patients has been reported. Now, projectile injuries, these are ferromagnetic metal objects, and hence attracted to the metallic board. And of course, this is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field strength. Higher the field strength, higher the chances of a projectile injury. Distance from the magnet, how near it is to the magnet, and the mass of the object, right? Now you can have various devices or implants which can cause projectile injury. This include aneurysmal clips, uh, spinal fusion devices, cardiac pacemakers, cochlear implants, hearing aids, heart valve prosthesis, dental implants, vascular and cardiac stents before six weeks. 
So we have certain safety rec recommendations for this. You need to have an installation of a metallic detector at the entrance of the MR imaging suite so that it beeps whenever something metallic goes inside. You need to do some kind of an MR shielding. And importantly, educate all the healthcare personnel and associated staff about the possible hazards with ferromagnetic materials. We have MRI facility zones in safety recommendations, right? So we have four clearly labeled distinct zones. I'm going to show you what they are. And this is to restrict the potential ferromagnetic materials in MRI scanner room. The four zones are labeled one to four and assess is progressive. So zone one is freely accessible to generally public and usually just outside the MR environment, right? Outside the MR environment. Zone two is actually the interface between the outside and the inside magnet and usually includes the reception, patient waiting area, toilets, nursing station, patient history room, right? Now zone three or four are the restricted zone and only screen people are allowed enter into this. This is where you need to be very strict with this. And this should be clearly demarcated with a notice. Zone four is actually the magnet room and it is marked with a red line and lighted sign which shows the magnet is on. So in line of sight of level two personnel and the MR technologist, and there should be video cameras to monitor the patient head in. It should be equipped with MR compatible resuscitation equipment and 5G line should be clearly marked. So after the static field, let's look at the effect of the changing gradient field. As you know, there we have gradient coils and so magnetic field gradients to encode the MR signal. And we have rapidly changing currents for microscopic movements in coils. You can have acoustic noise that is knocking and buzzing sounds and peripheral nerve stimulation. So acoustic injury, there is a potential for permanent hearing impairment and temporary hearing impairment has been reported. In fact, FDA has set up a limit of 140 decibels MR per system. And if you're doing with a hearing protection, that's around 99 decibels. So uh, temporary hearing loss has been documented in patients who underwent routine MR imaging examinations without protective devices. So this is your standard MR. 108, where the rock concert will be around 120 decibels, right? So again, uh, as far as safety recommendations for acoustic injury is concerned, use of disposable earplugs are, ear are recommended or over the ear headphones or defenders. This can attenuate the sounds by 10 to 30 decibels and earplugs are must in all new needs, all right? Uh, when peripheral neurostimulation effects, you can have arms and legs specifically showing pain and needles or severe pain. And FDA recommends that the decibel per uh, decibel strength be set to levels that do not result in peripheral neurostimulation without the specific one, right? This is great at greater risk for those involving the high bandwidth rate outs and rapid gradient switching. Magnetophosphines, what are these? These are an occasional phenomenon. The patient will note unusual visual disturbances during MR scanning will have stars in one eye or light flashes. And these result by induction from changing gradient fields. While radio frequency heating is the biological effect of radio frequency absorption, right? Maximum at the surface and minimum at the center of the body. And again, FDA has defined the limit, the body core increase of one degree. Uh, head, if the head degree, uh, if the head increases to 38 degrees, Celsius, trunk 39 and extremities increases to 40 degrees. This is the upper limit of the prescribed FDA limit for it, right? Of course, we have specific absorption rates, cal calculation and FDA has defined limits for whole body exposure should not be more than four and rest all other cases 1.5 watts per kilogram. Now burns have been reported as well. Uh, External objects, coil ECG leads can form conductive loops and heat up the tissue. And uh, specifically, it might be an issue with transdermal patches with traces of aluminium. It should be remo removed or away from the coil. Tattoos might be an issue, especially darker rings, which are rich in iron oxide, it can cause to local skin burns at times.
So safety recommendations include proper screening of patients, change out of street clothes, avoid skin contact, no cross legs, no arms on hips, no crossed arms. Don't coil the cables, keeping them in straight line, lower SAR whenever possible, manufacture provided padding and eyes and ears on patient at all times. As far as pediatrics is concerned, this, this is a slightly different ball game, right? The kids are more vulnerable to anxiety. So you would have sedation, you, Kids might need sedation at times. You can use it for mock MRI scan. Let me show you one. Then motion artifacts, again, would be an issue and sedation would be required. And for the neonates, you need to have earplugs in all kids, neonates. So as I said, sedation and uh, monitoring is an important topic for pediatrics. And this is essential for good quality images and uh, uh, proper sedation would be required in children for a good quality MRI, right? But for all these one, remember temperature monitoring is very important and resuscitation equipment should always be ready. Same thing. So this is a mock MRI scanner. This can alleviate need for sedation, especially in the kids who are a bit more receptive. And then the age group of let's say uh, five to 10 years, right? Really, you know, it familiarizes the child with the procedure and the child can lie down comfortably during the scan. And, probably avoid sedation at times. And as I have already said, acoustic noise in new nays is because of immature anatomical development. Uh, there's increased response to acoustic stimuli. And it can elicit autonomic instability in both terms and preterms, and you must use an earplug in all new nays, right? What about pregnancy and MR exposure? As yet, no harmful biological effects of MRI has been reported, but the FDA recommends. If the non-ionizing imaging, like ultrasound, is suboptimal, or if the information to be gained by MR would have required more invasive testing, like radiography, CT scan, or angiography, in that case, MR is acceptable. For healthcare practitioner pregnancies, they're permitted to work, no issues. For patient pregnancies, MR is risk-free during pregnancy, but MR contrast agent should not be routinely performed to pregnant patients. I'll come back to that later. What about effects of high field MR? So what is a high field MR? Anything more, more than 70s Tesla? Seven, Tesla is an ultra high field or UHF MR as it's called now. So the first system was the eight Tesla system at Ohio in 1998, nearly 22 years back. And the first seven Tesla system with approval as a medical device actually entered the market in 2017, four years back. I uh, believe that. So as far as high field MR is concerned, so you need to talk about, we need to consider the signal to noise ratio, specific absorption ratio and physiological side effects, right? So there's a pro and con to each of this at, when we're dealing with a very high field magnetic strengths. Physiological effects would include, of course, transitory effects like dizziness, nausea, elevated T waves, acoustic noise. And local SARS can differ and heating may result in local site burning. This is the major limitation with the high wind strength. Moving on to contrast agents in MRI. Now these are designed to reduce relaxation times, both T1, uh, T1 T2. We are basically using post-contrast T1 images. And gadolinium-based contrast agents are the most commonly used. We can have linear ones or microcyclic, ionic, or non-ionic. Right. Uh, this is a whole list of uh, the brand names, the chemical name, and the structures. Right. Remember, uh, gadabutrol is the only contrast agent approved for use in children less than two years initially. The adverse effects to contra MR contrast agents includes mild, moderate, and severe. The severe would include arrhythmias, diffuse edema, and hypoxia, and of course, contrast patients. And of course, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. One thing I forgot to mention here that if given a choice, we should go in for a macrocyclic non-ionic contrast rather than a linear contrast. We'll see that later. So nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is typically described in patients with renal insufficiency, Right, it is characterized by thickening, induration, and tightening of the skin with subcutaneous edema. 
this is how the skin would look like in severe cases you can have joint contractures and immobility so it is more described with non ionic linear and then ionic linear and then macrocyclic right but majority of times with very high doses or multiple doses in the short period of time that to linear contrast agents so now classification of contrast agent by the american college of radiology committee on drugs and contrast media and the ema european medicine agency and us fda now three categories are described based on the association with nephrogenic systemic fibrosis we have a group 1 which have been described as having the maximum effect with the nsf or the nephrogenic systemic fibrosis so these are by and large uh, stopped or contraindicated group 2 is the one more commonly recommended which includes multi hands pro hams dutota ram and gadavist while group 3 is are still newer agents with limited data and limited applications so these are the european medicine agencies the ema banned contrast agents in europe they are still in use in other parts of the world but these are the ones linear ones with far more effects of nsf specifically so they are not recommended now so these need to be known uh i think we all need to be aware of the chokes uh, questionnaire there are six questions even if you don't know the egfr or the estimated uh, renal function test or the correct renal function test you can ask this six questions and if all six or nine 94% of the patient would have a normal serum creatinine so this is one way of doing it in an emergency setting if you do not have access to the lab values and estimated gfr rates so the acr guidelines on contrast use specifically in chronic kidney disease so if in patients with egfr really less less than 30 so group 1s are contraindicated group 1 is again contraindicated if it is less than 30 not on dialysis the first one was on dialysis and group 2 agents are usually preferred that is the bottom line as far as the acr guidelines go if the egfr is less than 30 right contrast deposition in brain has been now been increasingly being reported these are like dose dependent signal hyperintensity in the dentate nucleus and globus pallidus on unenhanced scans and reported in patients with normal renal function actually these have been reported again with the linear groups gadolidiamide and gadopentate has not been directly linked to adverse health effects but fda had given a warning in 2017 specifically in children who undergo repeated mr scans with contrast like oncology patients tumor group patients who would require repeated three monthly or six monthly or yearly contrast examinations right say so mr can mr contrast be used in pregnant or lactating mothers so there are lack of control studies but studies have found increased risk in first trimesters there is no adverse effects on fetus as of now and so acr recommends a group 2 agents not group 1 group 2 agents with least possible dose with well documented risk benefit analysis and preferably after first trimester remember in first trimester of pregnancy is not recommended to give contrast after first trimester pregnancy if the risk benefit analysis has been done then a group 2 agents with least possible dose lactating mothers there is no no issue at all you can use contrast go ahead what about implants and mri so device safety on mri actually first introduced by astm international in 2005 has been like 16 years now so as of now the what are the norms is like you have for all implants three different categories have been defined whether they are mr safe mr conditional mr unsafe right and data on majority of the devices is available on www.mrisafety.com you can just go and have a look so either your device is going to be mr safe go ahead no issues is going to be mr conditional there don't be specific conditions of use or mr unsafe you cannot use it right so appropriately and accordingly the signals have been demarcated in a color code green yellow and red right so these are the different examples of mr safety as you can see this is green the iv line says mr conditional some pacemakers and mr unsafe 
scalpel or the metallic ones. So MR conditionals, the patients can be scanned with MR conditional like ECG leads, pulse monitors, cardiac monitors, right? All right. Well, intracranial aneurysm clips, well, certain types of intracranial aneurysm clips like those made from martinistic stainless steels that were earlier used. Now, these steels, stainless steels are not used nowadays in intracranial clips. So these were you know, clips made later than 1980 do not use this. Right, so you can use a plain CT or radiograph to confirm whether a clip is present or not. Although the newer ones do not use this, but the older intracranial aneurysm clips, if they are still there, that is a contraindication. So you need to have a specific information with the original package material, obtained written documentation, and consideration should also be given to the static magnetic field strength. On the other hand, cardiac implantable electronic devices, including cardiac pacemakers, defibrillators, loop recorders, or temporary transvenous pacing comes in it. These are conditional in use, right? And the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines has approved them. Cardiac pacemakers is MR conditional. So class one is a strong recommendation that has uh, only in context of an institutional workflow. While class two, a recommendation is the MR non-conditional systems perform MRI in the absence of fractured epicardial or abundant leads. So this is important, right? So uh, as far as these guidelines, if the device is MR conditional, go ahead. If it is not, their lead abnormalities do not perform MR. If there are no lead abnormalities, but pacemaker dependent, then you have need to proceed with question still whether you need to keep it on or you might need to remove it and then turn it on again. You might have to uh, call the cardiac guys sometimes for it, right? So as far as cochlear implants are concerned, again, the implants made earlier than 2010 are mostly labeled as unsafe. The recent cochlear implants containing an internal magnet have both US FDA and ASTM marking if they have manufactured, so they're pretty okay to use. So as you can see there, uh, this is a cochlear implant as a, on a plane radiograph. This is a radio frequency antenna. This is the external speech processor, and this is the electrode going through. This is the components of your scene and radiography. So MR conditional cochlear implants are there, yes, right? Uh, and a head wrap or a splint is often used during MR imaging. And after completion of the examination, this is important for cochlear implants specifically, you remove the splint, external speech processor is again inserted to check the functionality, and you can again do a radiograph to confirm the position of the magnet. Okay. As far as orthopedic implants are concerned, most that have undergone nailing or plating do not have any significant displacement. So if there's an orthopedic implant which is fixed nicely, right, they are not loose, they can be used in a 1.5 Tesla magnet under any setting, but they should be properly fixed and are passive. That's the main thing. Implant displacement and radio frequency heating, otherwise, is a major concern with orthopedic implants. So, implants absolutely contraindicated for MR would be cardiac pacemakers with abundant or fractured leads, temporary transvenous pacemaker leads, the temporary ones, okay? Intracranial aneurysm clips with martinistic steel as component and cochlear implants manufactured before 2011. Movable metallic implants or piercings anywhere in the body, which are movable. Patients with suspected pellets or shrapnels within the eye and insulin infusion pumps or drug delivery pumps with metallic components. This we need to be careful about. As far as emergencies in MR room is concerned, our MR suite should be equipped with emergency medical equipment on a crash cart. But the response, the medical emergency response should not be conducted in the zone four. You bring the patient outside to a designated area to provide medical care, right? Now, MR quenching is a very important term which you must be aware of. Now, this is a process where there is a sudden loss of absolute zero of temperature in the magnetic coils so that they cease to be superconducting and become resistive. The quenching causes helium to escape from the 
crash and bath extremely rapidly. Now this can happen accidentally or in an emergency by activating the quench button. So there is a quench button in each MR, right? So if you accidentally press it or in an emergency you have to press it, there is a sudden loss of absolute zero of the temperature in the magnetic coils. So what happens the liquid helium, which is at minus 269 degrees centigrade, boils off to become a gas with a high expansion ratio. So this is vented outside the building via the quench pipe. So there is a risk of asphyxiation, frostbite and damaged MR system. So if the pipe fails, there may be a buildup of pressure in the MR scanner room itself. Right, as seen here. So what to do in the event of a quench? So open the scanner room, evacuate the scanner room safely and oxygen monitoring if required. So I would like to conclude by saying the proper training of MR personnel working in the MR suite is very important and it should really be emphasized and re-emphasized. Familiarity with the missile effect of the ferromagnetic materials should be made aware to all the staff working there. We should try to reduce the acoustic noise whenever possible, specifically in units, by using earplugs. Look for radio frequency heating. Communicate well with the patient. Try to minimize sedation issues with pediatric patients. And develop or use a good screening questionnaire for contrast, implants, allergies, and pregnancy. Thank you. If there are any questions, you can email me or ask me anytime. Thank you so much.